can guess which hero we're going to talk about today. Moses, yeah, somebody got it in there. Moses is one of those gigantic kind of figures uh, in history and in the Bible. Uh, he's kind of bigger than life. And, and when we think about Moses, we often think about things like this. Have, have you ever wondered what it was like when, when he was up on the mountain and God was doing I'm pretty sure God doesn't look like bad animation, but, but you know... He, somehow he had an encounter and comes down with these, these tablets of stone. And, and so, you know, man, Moses is the lawgiver. Moses is the guy that delivered everybody out of slavery. Moses led the people. You know, Moses is just this gigantic uh, sort of figure. And, and it's easy to kind of think about him in the midst of all of his successes. Uh, and yet, he's a little bit different figure. We've, we've talked um, about how all, all heroes, all superheroes have... Uh, an origin story of some sort, you know, orphans for, you know, Superman and, and Batman and, and those. Um, and we even talked last week about the origin stories of Ruth and Naomi and, we, you know, they just all have that. But, but Moses is different than that. Moses has a very different uh, story. Uh, and yet, it's a story I think we can learn from because it's a story that involves a lot of pain. And so what we want to talk about today is that God loves sinners. Last week we talked about God loves losers. Praise be to God. Yeah, more you should say amen there. And God loves sinners a a a as well. And so um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 2. So flip over to Exodus 2. It's real easy. It starts with Genesis. The next book is Exodus uh, chapter 2. You can also get it on your phones uh, or on our app. We have the Bible, uh, a Bible on there as well. And so let me kind of set the stage for this. What's happened is the Hebrew children have been in slavery for 400 years. 400 years is a long time. They don't really have any memory of anything other than slavery. Uh, they've heard the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God of, that, that was their God. But from their perspective, they've been in slavery a long time. God doesn't seem to be hanging around a lot these days. Uh, and and uh, a new pharaoh comes to power in Egypt. And he kind of does a census and looks around and says, there are a lot of these Hebrew slaves here. Uh, and if there gets to be too many of them, that could be a problem for us. If there's more of them than us, what's to keep them from kind of taking over? Uh, so he implements some things to make their life miserable. And then that doesn't really work. And then, and then he, he says, okay, we're just going to solve this problem. And sends out a decree that for all of the Hebrew children, they had to throw their baby boys into the Nile River. And there's some great stuff about rivers and water there we don't have time for. Uh, but, but that was kind of the rule. And if we wipe out all the baby boys, eventually the population is going to come down. And everything will be wonderful was kind of the way the Pharaoh thought about it. Of course, it, it doesn't really work uh, like that. Um, and so I want to uh, kind of start out with the scripture. And we'll kind of pick it up again later. But the story is long enough in scripture. We can't really read it all to you. So I'm going to tell you part of it. We'll read it. And we'll kind of see where God has some great truth uh, that comes out of it. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter chapter 2. Let me pick up the story. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, you all have fine children, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> we all have fine children, okay? Uh, birth to a son, a fine child. She hid him uh, for three months, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it in tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds in the bank of the Nile. So technically she put her son in the Nile, okay? His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Uh, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. Uh, so the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. So here's the deal. Everybody else is throwing their babies into the river and they're dying. And Moses' mom has figured out how to not only uh, get, save his life, but now Pharaoh's daughter is paying her to take care of Moses. Pretty good deal uh, in all of this. Okay. When the uh, child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. 
So now Moses is the, uh, is the son of Pharaoh's daughter. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Uh, so there's a couple of things I, I want you to kind of get here uh, in the midst of, of all of this. Uh, and and that's, that's this idea that, that Moses really has it really good. This isn't like most superheroes. I mean, he's got it way better than any other Hebrews. He literally has been being raised in the palace. Wouldn't it be cool to grow up in a palace? Am I the only one that had that fantasy growing up? You know, it was kind of like, you know, anything he wants, uh, everything he wants, you know. He is always the coolest kid because he's Pharaoh's daughter, grandson, you know. So it's like, you don't mess with him. He had all the coolest clothes. Everybody, you know, paid attention to him. In addition to which, he would have got a great education, way better than anybody else. Uh, he would have been taught all of the, the math and the science of that time and, and the languages. He would have learned the languages of the other people in that place. He would have learned the culture. Uh, he would have been prepared for leadership. He would have learned how to lead and to manage, uh, to guide people, to discipline, to bring them together, to focus. All, all of that. I mean, he had the equivalent of an MBA from Harvard. He knew everything you needed to know uh, to be a, a great, great leader. And all of the people knew that he was a Hebrew. And so you can imagine among the Hebrew slaves, it's like, our ace in the hole is Moses. I'll, I'll bet the rumors kind of went through, you know, hey, did you hear what Moses did this week? Or, you know, Moses did that. Or one day Moses is going to be Pharaoh and he's going to set us free. Woohoo! We can't wait for Moses to become Pharaoh. I mean, the, the, he, he's got it all. It, it should work out. And so the, the, the way that Hebrews thought of it was kind of like this. Moses was the perfect person to liberate Israel. He, he had it. He was, he's the one, and, and he knew that he was a Hebrew, and he identified with them and, and cared about them, and so uh, everybody would have been pretty excited about, about all of that. And so it was just clear. It was clear to Moses. It was clear to the Hebrew children that, that obviously God was going to use Moses to set his people free. Um, in that part. And so uh, Moses uh, embraced that, we're pretty sure. And, and so the story kind of goes on as Moses is getting older. And, and somewhere around his 40th birthday, um, Moses, I, I, the only way I can explain it is he must have had a midlife crisis because uh, all of a sudden he kind of goes off the rails, you know. Guys, sometimes in our 40s we have a, a midlife crisis, you know, and, and we go out and we, you know, buy a sports car or something, you know. Uh, that, so getting a new car is better than getting a new spouse, okay? So, amen? Okay. But Moses didn't do any of that because he had it all. Well, what had happened is Moses is now thinking, it's time for me to save my people. It's time for me to do something about this. And so uh, one day he is out amongst the people, and he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, which would not have been uncommon uh, at all. But at this point, he either loses it or he's just tired of waiting. And so he intervenes, and Scripture records that he literally killed him with his bare hands. So it was up close and, and personal. He would have been very capable of that. He would have been trained in war and combat. Uh, and so really... Really, an Egyptian overseer would not stand a chance uh, against Moses uh, in there. And, and then he does something really interesting. He buries the body in the sand. Because he knows if they find out about this, even a son of Pharaoh would be held accountable for that. Because Egyptians were not to kill Egyptians. Now, burying a body in the sand is not a very good idea. Because the sand blows away in all of that. But he buried the body in the sand thinking, ha, look at this. I have gotten away with this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm good to go. And so uh, this sin... and. Uh, really destroys his life in so many ways. So for a minute, I want us to look at the, the two sins that, that really caught up uh, with Moses and, and destroyed his life. Um, and the first and the most important one is he tried to accomplish God's will with Moses' way. He knew that he was the one that God would use to deliver. He was the chosen instrument. It all made sense. Everybody knew that. But he got tired of waiting, and so he chose to accomplish God's will with Moses' way of getting things done. And, and, and that never has worked very well. I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm here to tell you I have tried this same thing myself. And it never goes well. When I try to use my way to accomplish God's purposes, God always goes, uh uh uh, nope, nope, nope. That's not the way it's supposed to work. And so the, the thing is, with, with Moses' way, Moses' way of, of delivering his people was gonna make Moses the hero. Everybody wants to be the hero, right guys? 
Yeah, we all want to be the hero, you know? So Moses is like, God's not doing anything. I'm going to take a little action. Everybody will love me. And they will all hail me as, as the new emperor. It's going to be great. And it wasn't great. Because he found out that the Hebrew children were actually talking about the fact that Moses had killed an Egyptian. That wasn't going to go well for Moses. And being the brave soul that he was, he ran for the desert as fast as he could go. He just headed out of all of that because he realized it had turned against him. So that sin then leads to the second sin, which we tend to think of as worse, and that is he committed murder. He killed somebody he wasn't supposed to kill. Um, and so when we think about these, we have a tendency to think that the committing the murder is the really bad one. And it, it's bad. Don't go away saying that murder wasn't bad. But, but honestly, it's the first one that led to the second one. And in many ways, this is true in our lives. Many of the things we think of as sins, that we, we label kind of the big ones, you know, we kind of went through the Ten Commandments, don't kill, don't steal, don't, you know, da-da-da. Most of those are what I call sins as symptoms of something else deeper going on. And usually, it's either rebellion against God or failure to trust God. Yeah. And, and, and in Moses' case, it was both. He trusted God, he trusted God, he trusted God for 40 years. I've been trusting you for a long time, God, get on with this. Anyone else prayed that prayer? And then he rebelled against God and gave up his way. And the result of that was murder. And so for, for uh, Moses, he's, he's got this terrible situation. He flees to the desert. He goes and he finds a wife. He gets married. He has kids. He starts his family. And he begins to wander in the desert as a shepherd. And so it's an incredible thing for him because, honestly, Moses' sin left him deeply broken. Everything that Moses expected out of life changed. You know, one of the things we know in life is that when our future changes, we go through a grieving process. It's often what happens if someone loses a spouse or, or a child. You have a way of that you think the world is going to be, and it's not going to be like that anymore. And for Moses, all of his life, his expectation is that he would either be Pharaoh or he would be a high official in Pharaoh's, uh, in Pharaoh's palace. He, he knew that the best was ahead for him and everything was good. He, he was going to have it all, and all of a sudden he has nothing. He thought he was going to live in a palace all his life. And now he lives in a tent. And shepherds sometimes don't even get tents. He thought he was going to be a ruler, and now he's got nobody to rule. He thought he was going to be famous, and now he's hoping nobody will find out who he is because the Egyptians will come get him. He thought he was going to be wealthy, and now he's poor. He thought he was going to be on the top of society, and now he's on the bottom. He thought he was going to be powerful, and now he's not. He thought he was going to be a leader. And now he leads sheep around in the desert. Everything changed for him. His whole, his whole life went away. And for 40 years, he just leads sheep in the desert and, and just lives. He's, like, he's in the, I am on God's trash heap, man. I just, uh, that's it. I'm, I'm done in all of this. So, so let me make a point that's hard. But I really need to make it because it's truth. And that is this. The cost of sin is always higher than you think. It is always higher than you think. In the moment of temptation, there are usually two things that go on. Number one, I won't get caught. That's the first lie the devil tells you. He hid the body in the sand. What did you think was going to happen? And number two, if I do get caught, it won't be that bad. And it never works that way. And, and this is a place where I think pastors have a unique perspective. Because I can't tell you how many times I have wept with people in my office as the consequences of their sin came to roost in their life. And they lost everything. Marriages, businesses, jobs, relationships, friendships. And they say, if I could only go back and tell young people, I don't want to say, we're telling them, okay? But they don't listen any better than you did back then. And so just hear me when I say this. As a pastor that loves you, the cost of sin is always higher than you think. Always higher than you think. And so, uh, and, and when I talk about sin here, I, I probably need to say this because some of us grew up kind of legalistic backgrounds. I'm not talking about that, you know, that stuff that, you know, if you go to the movie theater and Jesus comes back, you won't go to heaven kind of stuff. Yeah, some of you have been there. When I was growing up, like, the, the, the easiest way for a, a common definition of sin was if it was fun and God was against it. That was kind of the, the rule of thumb. When I talk about sin, I'm talking not about that stuff. I'm talking about that stuff you know in your heart 
it's wrong. Not because a mama told you or a preacher told you, but because you know, because the spirit of the living God says, that's wrong, don't go there. That's, that's wrong. That, that, that's what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about sin. And, and I'm telling you, the cost is higher than you think it is. So I just kind of want to pause for a minute here and say, you know, if you find yourself in that place this morning, that place where there's some sin in your past that, that, you, that, that destroyed your life or maybe it's destroying your life. That, it's something you can't get, get past and it, it messed things up and it, it, it's cost you a lot. And, and you're just kind of existing now. You're just kind of wandering around in the desert wishing those sheep would go away. You, you feel really literally like God has kind of thrown you on the trash heap of life. I, I have some good news for you out of the story of Moses and, and that is this. God's not done with you yet. I'm telling I don't care how bad it is or how big the sin was. Moses was a murderer, okay? And I'm, I'm hoping none of you are in that category. But if you are, God's not done with you yet. God is moving in the midst of it. He has a plan. He's going to do something. And so this, this is where this is like one of the great symbols of, of the Christian church and of Judaism. It's the burning bush. Say burning bush. Yeah, if I could figure out a way to do that, we'd have a burning bush symbol in our church, but the fire marshal doesn't think that's a good idea. So, you know, it's this wonderful thing. You know the story. He's out wandering around, doing his thing, and all of a sudden, he comes across the burning bush, just a shepherd out there. He is now 80 years old. Another 40 years have gone by. And in the desert, in his time, a burning bush wasn't all that unusual. It would happen from time to time. But this one didn't burn up. It just kept burning and burning and burning and burning. And so he's like, okay, that's a little different. And so he decides that he's going to go and, and, and approach uh, that, that burn, uh, that burning bush up there. And, you know, as, as he approaches it, uh, there's kind of an interesting sort of thing that, that happens uh, in that. And, that, and that's that, that God speaks to him. Now, I, I want you to get a hold of this moment because we're going to read it in just a minute. And when you read it in text, I think a lot of scripture, they've kind of just leveled out of a lot of things. But, but Moses is all alone in the desert. He knows that there is nobody out there but him. And he is walking up to a bush that is burning and not burning up already. So, you, you know, the, the kind of the skin of the goosebumps and the hair, and it's kind of like, it's a little weird, you know. And all of a sudden, out of the bush comes Moses. Now, I don't know what this is like for you, but I have experienced this personally. I mean, not a burning bush and talking, but I spend a lot of time in this building, and often I'm alone, and in the evening, you know, and in the winter, it gets dark in here, and my office is back in the back, and I know there's nobody in here. There's nobody, by this place, this place makes creepy sounds in the night, by the way, and I'm back there by myself, and one of you kind, loving souls will come in through the front door because you got a key. And you'll decide that you are going to bless me by coming back and talking to me and saying hello. And I am deep focused and I know there's nobody in there. And all of a sudden, Pastor Craig, how you doing? There are marks on my ceiling where I jump up and hit it, you know, every time, you know. Because I know I'm alone. So imagine Moses. He's like out there. There's nobody around. Moses, you know. And so scripture just, so I'm going to read it to you. But I just wanted you to get that moment because you need to kind of get a hold of how some of this works sometimes. So Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. Now, when we read this, we think that the purpose of this is so that he's close enough so that he'll hear the voice of God. But I think God is a prankster because I'm a prankster too, you know. I think I get that from God. My wife doesn't think I get that from God. But I think I get that from God. I, I, I think the, the better reading of this is, oh, good, he's close enough now. <laughs> God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. I'm thinking he cleaned up all the other stuff he did. Do not come any closer, God said. This is important. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. That is really an amazing thing for God to say. So hear this in a modern application. God's call on your life is holy. Moses the murderer has the very presence of God in the bush. And he is so close to God that God says, take off your shoes. Get prepared to be close to the holy thing. 
And I want you to know this. You need to hear this. I know what you have sin in your life. I know there's stuff there that nobody knows about. And you think, I can't. And God's thrown me on the trash heap of life. I am here to tell God has called you. And a holy God has called you. And what he's calling you to do is holy. Because you see, your call isn't holy because of what you're going to do. People think because I am a, I'm a preacher, my call is holy. Your call is holy because of who calls you. You understand that? If he's calling you to be a Sunday school teacher, it's holy because it is him that calls you. If he's calling you to be an usher, it's holy because it is a holy God that has called you. If he's called you to work in the kitchen, it's holy because it's a holy God that has called you, not because any of those jobs are holy. In fact, my job is pretty straightforward. My job is not holy because I'm called to be a preacher. My job is holy because God called me. And your calling is holy too. Whatever God is calling you to in your life, it's a part of it. And some of you, honestly, you've been, you've been hiding from God because of that, well, that Egyptian in the sand in your life. And you think, God can't use me. I've gone too far. If anyone found out about all of that. And so you have been playing hide and seek with God in the desert. Can, can I just give you some practical theological advice? Don't play hide and seek with God. It's not going to go well. He knows where you are all the time, and he knows what you're doing, and you can't fake him out. But you think that broken place in your life disqualifies you. And so the bush spoke to Moses, and, and, and it says to, he says to Moses, Hey, Moses, by the way, I'm going to rescue my people, and you're the person I'm going to use for the job. And this is interesting because now it goes 180 degrees. Forty years earlier, he was so convinced that he could do it that he was going to do it on his own. And now he starts to make excuses. The first thing he says is, who am I to do that sort of thing? I, I tried that before. It didn't work out so well. And God says, I'm going to be with you. Don't worry about it. I got this. So he comes up with the next one. He says, by the way, I don't even know your name. And so God says to him, my name is I am that I am. That's a stupid name. Right? That makes no sense. And here's one of the interesting things I love about the Bible. There are things in there that they don't understand until years and years later. And so uh, several thousand years ago when God has this, I am that I am, everybody goes, I don't know what that means. It just means I am that I am. I've read some old commentaries and they say silly things about this. Until Einstein came along. And Einstein taught us that time and matter are connected. That time is simply a function of matter in motion. So if you have no matter, you have no time. God is a spirit. Therefore, God li uh, lives outside of time. And if God lives outside of time, then I am that I am makes a ton of sense. It's the only right name for God. It, 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 I was before time, which is kind of funny talk, and I will be after time, and I am through time, and I am, and it, 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 time is, I am that I am. I am when I be, before you came along, and I am after you've gone. I am that I, it's such a, God's, I am that I am. Well, of course, that didn't satisfy Moses. Plus, it was just a confusing name. And, and then he, so it goes on, well, what if they don't believe me? And God says, what do you have in your hand? He says, a shepherd's staff. He says, throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground. Turns into a viper. Ooh, cool joke. Step away. You know, good job, God. And then he says to Moses, pick it up. Whoa. I mean, what do you do when God says, pick up a viper? Well, he had enough sense to pick it up. Turns back into a staff. He, he puts his hand in his thing. Pulls it out. He's leper. Puts it back in. He's not. And so God does this series of miracles. And, and, and that doesn't, uh, doesn't satisfy Moses. So finally he goes on. He makes it personally. He says, well, I stutter. And you want me to talk. So, so I, can't, I can't do that. Clearly, uh, you don't have a stutter or stand up and be the voice for God. And, of course, God says to him, I make the mouth and the tongue, dude. It'll be fine. I, I love that story because in the Church of the Nazarene, we have a great story that kind of goes along with that. Uh, back in the way old days, uh, there, there was a man that, that stuttered that was called into the ministry, and, and he argued with God. Uh, his name was Uncle Buddy Robinson, and he went on to become one of our greatest preachers. I stutter. Your inability does not impress God. Okay, he just, so, so this is where it was hard for him. In fact, now God's mad at him because he still doesn't want to do it. So he gives him his brother Aaron to, to help him. But, but here's the key. Here's what, what Moses had not yet learned. It's not about you. 
It wasn't about you when you thought you had it all together and you, you were the one to do it. It wasn't about you. And when you're now in this place and God's calling you and you keep making excuses why you can't do it, it's still not about you. It was then and it will always be about God. His call on your life. He's the one that, that will make it come to be in all of that. And, and you, you think you, don't, you can't let God's plans happen in your life? I'm telling you, you cannot make God's plans come true. That's the bad news. The good news is he doesn't expect you to. He expects to work through you. You are an instrument in the hand of the living God. It would be like, you know, you're all scalpels. It would be like giving the scalpel credit for the successful surgery. That makes sense at all. You give the surgeon credit, right? We're scalpels in his hand. And, and, and just to push a little fur, let me say this to you. Don't take this personal, but God doesn't need you. He wants you. He doesn't need you to accomplish his purpose. He wants to include you. He's giving you the opportunity to be a part of something bigger than your, yourself. And, and so you know the end of the story. Moses becomes an instrument in God's hand to deliver his people, to bring the law, to lead them, to protect them, to help them through all of that. And here's what we know out of these stories. God always uses unlikely heroes. He always uses unlikely heroes. You, you go through scripture, think about Paul. Paul was a murderer. He becomes the greatest theologian. David was a murderer and, a, and an adulterer. He becomes the great king. You know, Peter, who denied Christ, becomes the leader of the church. And he eventually struggled with racism. And still, God used him in all of that. God always uses unlikely heroes. And so you say to me, I'm an unlikely hero. Congratulations, that makes you qualified. That's, that's the way God works. You know, well, I'm a mess up. Great. That's on the, the, the things we need on the list here of the, the job description is you can't have your act all together because Moses had his act all together and he really got himself in a lot of trouble. So God has a plan and a purpose for your life right now. Amen. Okay. Uh, God loves and uses profoundly broken people. He just does. He, he loves and uses profoundly broken people. Moses thought he was on the trash heap of life. God doesn't have a trash heap. In fact, here's what I know about God. God is green because God recycles people. Amen? Don't you forget that. God recycles people. The next time you're talking to somebody that thinks that God has no use for them, they've gone too far, they failed too much, say God is green. God recycles people. God doesn't have a trash heap. He don't need it because he can recycle your life if you'll let him do that in his. God cares about that. And one of the things I love these days is, is the whole reclaimed wood. I, I love that idea. You are all reclaimed wood. Every one of us are. You are not beyond God's ability to recycle in your life. And so there's a couple more things. Everything Moses did that mattered for eternity happened in the last third of his life. How many of you are under the age of 80? Good, God's not done with you yet. He was 80 when the bush showed up for him. That's how God does. And for some of you who are older, God is not done with you. If you are not in the grave, God still has a purpose and a plan for you. It's one of the great things about following Jesus. You know when God's done with you. Because someone like me is standing over you pronouncing nice words. And until then, God's not done with you. It's not too late. You are not too old or too young or too short or too tall or too dumb or too small or too smart or too far gone or too touchy or too grumpy. or, or any, but Stop playing hide and seek with God. God has a plan. And then God used Moses a broken place for good. This is, this is one of the coolest things about this. We all know how Moses was prepared to lead the masses because he had that Harvard MBA. He had learned all about leadership and management. He had learned about all of those sorts of things. But do you know what he did for 40 years? He wandered in the desert and he learned what it was to live in a desert. He learned where the water was. He learned what you could do and what you couldn't do. He learned about the people around that place. He learned how to survive under difficult circumstances. And God did this amazing thing where he brought together the first part of his life and he brought together the broken part of his life and he welded it together into maybe the greatest leader we have ever known. Isn't God good? And I'm here to tell you, your broken place, God wants to use that in your life. So real quickly now, two essentials to overcoming broken places. Number one, you have to let God in. You have to say yes to the burning bush. You have to say yes to what he's calling you to do. You, you, you can't hide from any of that. And, and I know there's some of you that are like, oh man, 
can I just tell you a little thing? One of the things I've discovered over the years is, is most of us are willing to be as transparent about a certain number of indiscretions and sins and, and things in our life, but most people have a secret file. And it's a file that very few people know about. It may be that not even your spouse knows what's in that file, and in that file is your deepest, darkest secret. It's the file that we bury in the sand. It's the Egyptian that we killed. It's that, it's that thing that, that no one else knows about. And you keep thinking that because of the Egyptian in the sand, I cannot be used of God. I am here to tell you, say yes to the burning bush. Because God can overcome Egyptians in the sand. Amen. I just, you just got to, don't, don't let something get in the way of that. And then number two, you have to follow him. You got to do it God's way. You can't do it your way. Doing it your way never works. It just doesn't. Listen to someone that's tried a couple of times and, and experienced the pain for it. Let him have control. Let Christ have control of your life. And so then if our musicians would come, let me ask you this question. Where do you need to say yes to God this morning? That thing that God has been speaking to you and you know you need to say yes. And you're thinking about that, that Egyptian buried in the sand. Think I can't, I th you know, there's that, it, if anyone found out, you know, I'm telling you, say yes to the burning bush this morning. Say, say yes to what God wants. For some of you, maybe that looks like a call into ministry. God is still calling people into ministry today. For some of you, maybe that means something around the church. Maybe there's an area where you need to step up or something. God, maybe it's, it's something in our community. Maybe, I, I don't know what it is, but I know God wants to use you. And it doesn't matter about the Egyptian buried in the sand. It matters what you say when the burning bush shows up. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Amen.